The illustrator who would come to be known as Gus Bofa was christened Gustave Blanchot, and he was born in brive la gaillarde in western France in 1833, the 11th of 12 children. His childhood was spent in Bordeaux, but the family moved to Paris in 1893, when his father was appointed military commander of the Senate. In 1900, when he was still only 17, he started selling some of his cartoons to French magazines, including La Risette and the Almanac Nodo. These were simple black and whites featuring large-headed characters, similar to the work of the illustrator known as Caran Dash, by far the dominant visual humorist of the time. And this same stylistic approach endured when he began creating colour covers for Le Rire and Le Surya, both of which became regular clients in the early years of the decade. Both his career had to be put on hold while he completed his compulsory military service in 1904, but in 1906 he started to create posters for the Parisian Office of Art and Publicity, and the images he produced in this context enhanced his reputation as an illustrator considerably. So now he was working for magazines and creating lithographic colour posters for a variety of clients. And his jocular posters really stood out in an environment where such overt cartoon styling had not so far put in too much of an appearance. The early influence of Caran Dash had by this point completely disappeared and was replaced by an altogether more distinctive gestural linear style with predominantly brush line work and an apparently casual but highly expressive approach to human anatomy and body language. And it was this spontaneity which really gave his work a powerful suggestion of animation. In 1908 he was appointed art editor of Le Ria, and by the turn of the decade it was naturally enough his most frequent vehicle of expression, with a large number of colour covers and page monochromes, and in 1912, he briefly became editor of the rival Le Surya, and although it isn't stated, I assume he had given up his position at Le Rire to do so. And even with his editorial role and magazine illustration, he continued to produce yet more posters, all of which harnessed his pronounced sense of the comedically absurd to attract the attention of the Parisian public. But in 1914, France went to war against Germany, and along with thousands of other considerably younger men, he enlisted in the army at the age of 31. Unfortunately, this was to be short-lived because in December of 1914, he was caught in a storm of machine gun fire, and both legs were so badly damaged, the doctors were keen to amputate at least one of them. But Buffer refused, and although both his legs were saved, he would never walk with any degree of comfort again. Even from his hospital bed, the war became understandably his primary subject, and he subsequently appeared frequently in the pages of the magazine La Bayonette, which had been launched in 1915 as a direct response to the conflict. And although many of the images created were understandably gloomy in tone and execution, some were more positively cheerful morale-boosting visual responses. At this time he also drew a series of drawings later gathered as Chez les Tubib, which translates as with the sawbones, which referred with bleak humour to the butchery of wartime surgery and medicine. In the same year his collaboration with the writer Pierre MacAulon, titled Les Poissons Morts, containing melancholy and far from humorous wartime images was also published. And it was in 1916 that Buffa married Alice Lowenstein Peter, who ran the popular Parisian El Dorado Music Hall and was 20 years his senior. In 1917, Bofa collaborated again with Mac Orlon on the book U713, a dark but slapstick account of a fictitious U-boat crew and their misadventures and ultimately unhappy end. After the war, with the encouragement of Mac Orlan, he increasingly turned to book illustration, and in 1919 his own illustrated novel, Roll Mops, The Seated God, containing a series of engaging loose monochromes demonstrating his talent for expressive loose-limbed anatomy was published, but it didn't make a particularly strong impression. And in 1921, he also produced a series of woodcut book cover illustrations, including several for stories by Sherlock Holmes creator Arthur Conan Doyle. In the same year, he published The Book of the Hundred Years' War, another collaboration with Mac Orlan. 
The visual material reproduced in this book had been created earlier by Bofa for La Bayonette as a fairly frivolous parody of the Great War, and its conversion to book format with additional imagery and text proved to be a popular success with the French public. In 1922, Bofa had a series of manically comic circus-themed wood-engraved illustrations published in La Charrette, a journal which featured several contemporary French humorists in turn, and his issue made distinctive use of an unusual limited colour palette to enhance his solid line work. Some of the same images were also used in the following year's book Le Cirque, now with text by his friend and regular collaborator Mac Orlan. In this publication they were all printed as black, white and neutral, but the absence of colour was no detriment whatsoever to the visual quality of the images published. A year later he published another book, a series of brightly coloured comic visual representations of the literary work of various French authors. I have no actual proof of it, but it's quite likely this collection was printed as pochoir prints from monochrome original drawings. At this time, Bova was instrumental in setting up the Salon de la Reine, which aimed to elevate the status of illustrators more in line with the way painted art was viewed. But unfortunately, it wasn't a conspicuous success. In 1927, what was undoubtedly one of his greatest illustrated classics was published. This was his edition of Miguel de Cervantes' 17th century masterpiece, Don Quixote de la Mancha, known in France as Don Quixote. By this point his drawing and application of colour had become even looser but no less expressive than his earlier broader comedy. But here, if proof was needed, was an example of illustration's ability to possess every bit as much meaning and visual eloquence as any work of fine art. And once again these radically stylized illustrations also look very much as if they had been produced using the Poshwa method. But they might have been watercolour originals printed as full colour. But however they were created, both as highly personal visualisation of the text remains arguably the most visually distinctive. Only a year later he created an equally absorbing and aesthetically considered series of monochrome etchings to illuminate Thomas de Quincey's 1827 satirical work Assassination considered as one of the fine arts. This series used the unconventional device of having a small scribbled additional image placed at the bottom of the dominant more considered illustration it accompanied. And once more he demonstrated his ability to engage the viewer and compel them to analyse the emotional narrative content of each image, from the humorous to the downright sinister. In 1930 he published his own book Malaise, a limited edition of just 540, and as the title suggests this was a dark exploration of the inner landscape, described somewhat elliptically by Bofa as seen from daily life when the clock responsible for cutting this life into small edible pieces tragically stops. 1932 saw the publication of yet another graphic masterpiece in the form of Voltaire's 1759 novel Candide. Again, I'm forced to guess about the method of their creation, and they might be ink and watercolour, but equally they look rather like tinted etchings. But whichever they were, there were yet another impressive body of narrative images. Sadly, in 1934 his wife died at the age of 70. Naturally, he was grief-stricken by the loss, but immersed himself in the creation of more work. His book titled Zoo was published in 1935, and although ostensibly comedic, it argued that man had lost most of his natural instinctive behaviour and was by now completely alienated from the world he had known and understood. These images also used the same sub-illustration device he had used with equal success in his earlier work for the De Quincey book. And with an obviously deepening pessimistic outlook, in 1937 he published The Symphony of Fear, which combined text and images to create an essay on the nature of fear and its effect as a driving force in the human condition. There was undoubtedly humour in these pages, however bleak, but they were certainly not jokes, and their psychological subtext could be said to have elevated them to a level few in illustration or art could achieve. Both were married again in 1940, this time to Catherine Grossos, and this time around it was he who was 20 years older than his bride. 
But in that year, Hitler's forces marched into Paris, at which point Bofa and his young wife cleared out to the rural town of Maupertuis, some 50 kilometres away. From there he continued to work, if only at a much reduced volume, and in 1940 his book of grainy doodles with hand-scribbled quotes titled Slogans was published, but it met with little popular success. But despite the ongoing war, the following year's edition of the Tales of Edgar Allan Poe and its agreeably murky monochromes fared considerably better. In 1944 France was liberated, and in 1947, perhaps as a response to the end of the war, both were published the uncharacteristically frivolous The Free Way, a book of drawings and written musings on the theme of tourism and travel. But in 1950 he published another disillusioned and pessimistic reflection on the human condition, The Uncertain Cruise. Initially published as a limited edition of only 360 copies, this collection of exceptionally short imaginative stories and equally idiosyncratic and occasionally unsettling colour and monochrome pages combined to produce what was effectively a picture book intended for adults. Many, but not all, invoked earlier historical periods, using a blend of ink and charcoal shading with added splashes of transparent colour to considerable effect. And only a year later the book De Blay was published, with yet another collection of deceptively loose psychologically motivated monochrome etchings, which showcased just how far he was willing to push his style deeper into abstraction and disregard for conventional notions of reality while remaining highly evocative and visually eloquent. In 1956 he created a series of good-natured comic narrative illustrations for The Little World of Don Camillo, written by Giovanni Guareschi some eight years earlier. And although now in his seventies the evidence of these engaging loose colour images shows that Bofa had lost none of his creative edge. I don't know for sure that this was the last published work in his lifetime, but I found no more dated examples. And Gus Bofa died at the age of 85 in 1968. I can't help but feel that despite the fact that he is most frequently defined as a cartoonist, it's a woefully inadequate term for Gus Bofa. He was certainly prolific in terms of creating broadly humorous images, and he even made jokes to accompany his pictures on occasion. But all his work, and particularly his later output, also had a depth and a frequently bleak pessimistic philosophical outlook which we don't usually associate with the term cartoon. And as far as I'm concerned, he deserves a far more exalted place alongside other art pioneers of the 20th century who attract considerably more respect and admiration for their contribution to the visual landscape of the modern world. <laughs>